need to turn a little bit. Still a little bit more so. There you go. We'll get this fixed in a minute. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Because it's live. It's live. All right. Well, good morning to all of you. Um, want to uh, share with you today some things. If you read the email, you know what I'm going to be talking about, basically. And um, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be very, very interesting. So be sure to don't get distracted. Don't let the, if the speaking of the telephone, would you bring me my coat? Um, I forgot to, for, yeah, yeah. Oh, that thing's heavy. Yeah, sure, it's, it's very heavy. Uh, it's all that money I got in there. Thank you. Money bags. Yeah. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about some things I think you'll find very interesting about prophecy. We're just a wee bit informal today, but that'll be okay. Uh, so it is 10... 31 here. I want to make sure that is off. Now listen very carefully because what you're going to share, uh, learn today, a lot of this uh, you may not have ever heard before. It appears to me that things are beginning to shape up to cause Revelation 13 to be fulfilled. Let's ask God's blessing and we're going to get right into this. Eternal God, help me to present this in the way that your people can be blessed and benefited from it. And Heavenly Father, open up the minds of the people to take these things to heart and to repent and to get right with you and to make sure that they're staying on their guard against false prophets and against all the stuff that's out there today. God, open up the hearts and minds of your people to understand this. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, I want to start with... Um, now I can't find my reading glasses. They fell off. They're probably under your coat. Maybe. Oh, there you are. Okay. I want to uh, read you some, first of all, some news items. And I want you to pay close attention because I just learned this. Last Saturday, a week ago, on May 2nd, here's one news source that says, quote, In his decades of beekeeping, Ted McFall had never seen anything like it. As he pulled up, this was in the state of Washington, he pulled his truck up to check on a group of hives, beehives, near Custer, Washington in November. Now, this is reported this past week. He could spot from the window a mess of bee carcasses on the ground. As he looked closer, he saw a pile of dead members of the colony, uh, bee colony in front of a hive and more carnage inside. Thousands and thousands of bees with their heads torn from their bodies and no sign of a culprit. Only later, I don't think I even got this on, only later did he come to suspect that the killer was what some researchers simply call the murder hornet. Mm -hmm. Anybody heard of the murder hornet? Oh, yeah. With queens that can grow to two inches long. That's about like that. That's a huge hornet. Asian giant hornets can use mandibles shaped like spiked shark fins to wipe out a honeybee hive in a matter of hours. Now, what's the problem with wiping out honeybee hives? Back in the 1960s, one honeybee in the United States was worth $100 to agriculture because we have plants, they bloom, of course, in the springtime, and if the honeybees are dying off, it's going to affect agriculture. If the agriculture is affected, it affects our food, and then we're going to have drastic food shortages, which means your prices are going to go drastically sky high, and eventually we'll have famine. That's prophesied in Deuteronomy 28. So now the honeybee, now what's one honeybee worth today? I heard somebody say, don't, back in the 60s, don't kill you a honeybee, put it in an envelope, mail it off to the federal government, think they're going to pay you $100. It's only worth $100 when it's out there flying around doing what it's supposed to do. And it's pollinating our, our plants so that we can have food for the country. Now we got these murder hornets though that are killing off the honeybees. There are some plants that cannot reproduce without the honeybee. They cannot make fruit without the honeybee. They are absolutely vital to agriculture in this country and around the world. But he said thousands and thousands of bees with their heads torn from their bodies were laying there on the ground, and then he found out it was the murder hornet. Queens can grow up to two inches in length. Asian giant hornets can 
They have potent venom, and they have a stinger long enough to puncture a beekeeping suit. Now, you've seen these people on television with the beekeeping mask over their face, and they got this suit on so they can't be stung. And, uh, but these things have a stinger so long it can go right through that suit. And they're called murder hornets. They make excruciating, an excruciating combination <clears throat> the stinger and the venom that have likened, uh, the victims have likened it to hot metal diving into their skin. <clears throat> in Japan, and I heard this on Dr. Oz's show just yesterday also, the hornets kill up to 50 people a year. Every year, 50 people die from these hornets. These are lethal insects. Now, for the first time, they have arrived in the United States, end of quote. Now, people ask me a question some years ago when AIDS got to be famous back in the mid-80s, is that a judgment of God? And it depends on how you define judgment. Sometimes God brings things on us. Sometimes he sits back with his arms folded and he allows the natural consequences. A parent might do that with a child. He might just sit back and allow the child. He says, now don't touch that. It, it might fall on you and hurt you, but he knows it won't hurt him bad. So he may, the kid won't listen. He's rebellious. So the parent just stands back and says, okay, he'll find out for himself and allows that to fall on him, and he starts to cry, and he says, I told you not to touch that thing. Now, if the child is running out into the street, he can't do that. He has to get rough with that kid, and he has to force that child, and I mean, at the point of threatening him with a spanking with a belt or whatever it takes to keep him out of the road. He's three years old. You know, you got to do what you have to do to protect him because they don't have the mind to figure that out. God sometimes will stand by and allow the consequences to come, and sometimes they're a whole lot worse because, after all, we're not three-year-olds, we're adults. God says in the Bible, I set before you blessing and cursing. I set before you life and death, therefore choose life. So, you know, in one sense, God is pro-choice, if you want to know the truth about it. But he tells you how to choose. He says, it's your choice. No one has ever driven to the abortion clinic at Planned Parenthood. No one's ever driven there. And God put a great big hand out to stop the car where they couldn't drive. God let them do it. He tells them how to choose, but then he stands back and watches to see what decisions you're going to make. And if you make the wrong decisions, you, you will pay the natural consequences. And America is now being invaded by these murder hornets, and God's letting it happen. Why? Could it be because of things that we have been doing as a nation? <clears throat> the Sun, here's another news source, wrote on May 2nd, Thank you. That was last Saturday. Honeybees, I'm quoting, honeybees are being wiped out by a mystery disease that is sweeping Britain, researchers say. So we've got the murder hornets. They've got some kind of disease. This is going to cause food shortages. Infected bees die within a week. This leads to piles of dead insects just outside hives. Experts say it's being fueled by importing queen bees from Europe. That's causing it to get worse. Now, I don't want to hit you with a lot of bad news because you hear it all the time on television, but the reason I'm telling you this is to give you some encouragement and some hope. You say, how's that encouraging? Because if we're living for Christ, there's a scripture that says when judgment begins to fall on this nation, all these things, all of them, you can escape. Even the coronavirus, you can escape it. Read Psalm 91. If you're serving Christ, it says the wicked They'll be dying all around you, but it won't come nigh thy dwelling. Now, that's encouraging. And I want to share with you, it is not true, and you already know this. It is not true if you're a Christian, you won't get sick. It is not true if you're a Christian that you won't go through trials. You already know that's, that's not the case. We do get sick. We do go through trials. But when these judgments come upon us, God said, okay, if you're keeping my word and you haven't denied my name, I will protect you. Now, that's one of the things that's happening is insects. Um, and then it mentions honeybees also. Let me share something with you out of Deuteronomy. Now, now Deuteronomy 28 is the blessings and curses chapter. And verse 1 says, if you keep all of his commandments, all these blessings come on you. And then you go through verses 1 through 14 read about all these wonderful blessings. And America has had a lot of these blessings. Verse 11, God will make you plenteous in goods. And America is one of the most abundant 
nations, probably the most prosperous nation in the world. But now listen to verse 15. But it shall come to pass if you will not hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command you this day, then all these curses will come upon you. Listen to, um, let me look down the verses here I want to read to you. Verse 21, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave to you. If it cleaves to you, it won't let go. The COVID virus is cleaving to, to Americans, and thousands have now died in this country because of this disease. Until he has consumed you from off the land where you go to possess it. Now, he's talking about all this beautiful promised land they were given. God said, but it's going to be bad on you if you disobey me. Verse 22, the Lord will smite you with a consumption. Tuberculosis is a consumption, and that has been coming back. And with the fever, and with an inflammation, and with an extreme burning, and with the sword. You, you know, you go into a, a, a clinic now, and they got this little thermometer thing. They can just put it up next to your head until you've got a temperature. I, did my, I, I try to go to the dentist every six months for a general checkup. My dentist was closed in March, so I finally went to one just yesterday, uh, some miles from the house, and, and the first thing they do is they take your temperature, and mine was 97, so I'm doing good, but I'm doing well. But the thing is, God said one of the problems would be a fever. And now you go into public places. I went into the eye doctor's house, uh, house his clinic, his business the other day, and there's a lady standing outside. Never in my entire life have I ever seen this. And she's got this little thing, and she puts it up to my head, takes my temperature before she lets me in. God said one of the problems would be a fever. And with blasting and mildew, until you, until, uh, those things will pursue you. This, this virus, this COVID-19 virus is pursuing people. And we wonder why God allows it, because he allows you free choice. The Lord, verse 27, will smite you with the botch of Egypt, which that meant something to the Israelites. We're not exactly sure what that is. People have different ideas. And with the emeralds and with the scab and the itch wherever you cannot be healed. And I won't read all of that. But verse 45 says, Moreover, all these curses shall come upon you. Now, now let me back up. You say, oh, but that's only for the Jewish people. We're Gentiles. That doesn't apply to Gentiles. Oh, really? Tell that to the Ninevites. They, they became wicked, and God sent Jonah down there to say, I'm killing all of you in 40 days because of your wickedness. And they were Gentiles. Tell that to Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities. They were Gentiles. You read the book of Ezekiel. God pronounced judgment upon Egypt. He pronounced judgment upon Tyre and Sidon. And then you read Zephaniah, and you learn about Ashkelon and Gaza and Ashdod. And all these were Gentiles. And yet God pronounced judgment on them, didn't he? So don't think that America, which has some Israelites and some Gentiles in it because it's a mixture, don't think that we're going to escape. We're not going to escape. Why? Because God is no respecter of persons. These curses will come upon you, anybody, including America, and shall pursue you and overtake you till you be destroyed because you didn't hearken to the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes. Oh, but the commandments were done away at the cross. That's what my pastor told me. Your pastor is ignorant. Or he's uninformed, the same thing. Or he's stupid. Or he's lying to you. And I would prefer to be generous and charitable and say he's just ignorant. Don't listen to these people who tell you that God's commandments are done away. That's why Nineveh was eventually destroyed. Nahum talks about the eventual destruction. This time they didn't get out. And they shall be upon you for a sign and a wonder and upon your seed. Now, verse 47. Why? Because you didn't serve the Lord with joyfulness. And with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Who does that apply to more than any other nation in history but the United States of America? You didn't uh, uh, worship God and praise him and serve him for the abundance of all things. No, once we get full, then we turn our back on God as a nation. I don't mean you. I mean the nation as a whole. Verse 59. Then the Lord will make your plagues wonderful. Now, in Old English, 400 years ago, wonderful meant full of wonder. You're going to stand aghast and say, what in the world is this? The plagues will be full of wonder. And the plagues of your seed, and great plagues, and of long continuance. They don't know when this coronavirus is going to be finished. It might go for another full year or longer. They just don't know. 
and sore sicknesses of long continuances. Verse 60, moreover, he'll bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt. We're getting now the diseases that have hit Japan and China because of our disobedience to God as a nation. Now, you can say, well, that's your opinion, Slav. What do you, you know what you're talking about. Romans 2.11, God's no respecter of persons. If he, if he punished his own chosen people, what's he going to do to Gentiles like me? He punished his own chosen people. He'll do it to America. And another thing, too. Israel was really not as responsible as America is. You say, oh, how can you say that? Because we have Bibles in every motel room, almost every home you've ever been in in your whole life. Somebody had a Bible sitting on the coffee table in the bookcase. But the average Israelite had never seen a Bible. They had Moses telling them what the law was. They had prophets telling them. But they didn't know the Bible. I can go home right now. I've got, I'm not making this up. I've got a bookcase that's about six feet tall, I think. It's got like four or five shelves on it, maybe six, I don't remember. Every, every single, what do you call it, shelf, every single shelf, the whole thing's full of Bibles. I'm from top to bottom, the only thing I've got in that entire bookcase is Bibles. I brought my aunt over. She, um, she's now a widow, but she was married to a pastor for over 60 years, and I, she wanted to come in and see the house, and I showed her that bookcase. She said, well, nobody can say you haven't had a chance to read the Bible or words to that effect. We've got Bibles in almost every home in America. Almost every home. The Israelites didn't have that and God punished them. What's he going to do to you? Now, I know we people say well I don't have time you know the ball game's on. I don't have time reading my Bible. Well I got to do this. I got to do that. I got I to do all these. I don't have time reading my Bible. And you know, keeping the Sabbath so inconvenient, keeping the Holy Days old, that's so inconvenient. I mean, I just don't have time. I, I'm sorry, you know, I just don't have time. Well, that's your business. God sets before you life and death, blessing and cursing. He said, choose, and you're making a choice, whether you realize it or not. He will bring upon you all the diseases of Egypt. Now we're getting them from, from Asia, which you were afraid of, and they shall cleave you. Now listen to verse 61. This is Deuteronomy 28, verse 61. Also, every sickness and every plague which is not written in the book of this law, then will the Lord bring upon you till you be destroyed. COVID-19 wasn't mentioned. Did you notice that? AIDS wasn't mentioned. Did you notice that? A lot of the modern diseases were not mentioned, but God said the ones that are, are not even written in this book, oh, you'll get them too. Now, Nobody had heard of this herpes simplex 2 virus until sometime in the 80s. And then the AIDS virus, HIV, was never heard of until about 1981. And I had never heard of the coronavirus until just a few months ago. So what's going to crop up next year? And what about five years from now? And how in the world are we going to pay a national debt? But if you are the kind of Christian you're supposed to be, you can escape all these things that shall come to pass. Luke 21, 36. Ninety-some percent of the graduates of our college, they learned the truth and turned around and walked away from it. It was not convenient. The day will come when they will be so far away from God or so involved in their own churches that when these things happen, they'll be asleep to it. Oh, isn't it wonderful? They've rebuilt the temple. Hey, did you hear they're offering up sacrifices? Isn't that wonderful? Listen, when they do that, the seven-year period has started. Not the tribulation, the seven-year period is different. The first three and a half years of that seven-year period is probably going to be, as Paul called it, peace and safety. Things going nice. I'll tell you what, knowing what I know about the Bible, if I wasn't right with God, and I don't mean just being saved now, because I assume every one of you have made your commitment to Christ. I'm talking about living for Christ. If I wasn't living for Christ, and they built the temple yesterday and started offering sacrifices this morning, Man, if I wouldn't live right, I'd go to my prayer closet and I'd do some big, heavy repenting because I want to escape all these things that are going to come on this country. And they will come. But 97% of our graduates, they, they got their degree, walked away, we never saw them again. We've got a church here, but they didn't join the church. They didn't have any part of it. We won't support the church because they're so involved in the traditions of men, and some of you are too, you're so involved in your church traditions that you won't come out of the world. Revelation 18, 4, come out of her, my people. That's what Jesus says, come out of her, my people. 
let me, I'm still in the news. I haven't got to the full thing yet. I want to, the main thing we'll talk about is the third. This is the first one here, the first sign that we're in the last days. Now, here's the second one. I've got to turn to Revelation 19. I'm sorry, not 19. Revelation um, 9, not 19, 9. Now, listen to this news item. Forbes, everybody's heard of Forbes magazine. It's a financial magazine, yeah. And this was just two weeks ago, about two weeks ago or so, on the 30th of April. Here's what they said. Quote, for Russia, the question of robots taking over the role of soldiers on the battlefield is a matter of when, not if. Living fighters, now this is a quotation from a Russian guy, Vatily Davidov. He told RIA Novosti. Now, these are Russian news sources that I can't really pronounce. But anyway... This was on April 21st when he made this quotation. Listen to this, quote, Living fighters will gradually begin to be replaced by their robotic brothers who can act faster, more accurately, and more selectively than people. That's what he told them. That's the end of his quotation. Now, the, the um, Forbes continued to say, The development parallels many robotic programs underway in the United States. It is remarkable, too, that both nations have hit upon, listen, swarms of ground robots as a way to supplement existing human formations in combat. Russia plans to test swarms of ground robots later in, guess what year? The year 2020. Listen to Revelation. Uh-oh. Could you get a... I'm going. Thank you. I don't know how that happened. Got some water here in the spill. I'll guarantee you that the devil doesn't want you to hear what I'm giving you today, so just pay close attention. All right, now, <clears throat> listen to Revelation. I believe it's, uh, i got it written down here. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let me. Uh, oh, here. Yeah, I want to take care of that. <clears throat> I'll tell you what. <clears throat> Came in this morning. The Internet wasn't working. I'll guarantee you the devil doesn't want you to hear this today. Probably half full. Should be best. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate that. Sorry. That's all right. Things happen. I was hoping, I was trying to make sure you had enough. And yeah, I appreciate that. You made a mess. I'll tell you what, it sure is good to have someone here who, who has had custodial experience. <laughs> the most overqualified janitor the school's ever had. She's an overqualified janitor. She has a doctorate in theology. She still cleans. Huh? Yeah. Okay. Um, chapter, I think it's chapter nine. Yeah, chapter nine here. Now, listen to this. Thank you very much. It says here, now, we know this is talking about demons, but remember there's a dual application in prophecy. Always keep that in mind. Now, chapter 9, verse 1, the fifth angel sounded, and they saw a star from heaven, which is star in Revelation 120, represents an angel, uh, fall from uh, unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit, or the great abyss. And he opened the bottomless pit, or the abyss, the Greek says, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun of the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, we know there's a place called Tartarus where, where the worst demons are held captive right now today. And there came out of the smoke locust upon the earth. Locust. Are these actual locust, or do they just look like locust? And unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. If you don't have the seal of God in your forehead, then these demons will be allowed to get at you. And to them it was given that they should not kill, but they should just be tormented. They wouldn't be allowed to kill people, but just torment them. I saw just last night, and this was on Dr. Oz's show. I, was, I recorded earlier, then I watch it later. And they had a fellow on there who was, he was, I don't know if he was an entomologist or what he was, but he said, let's find out what happens when you get stung by one of these murder hornets. And he had one like in a glass, and he rolled his sleeve up, and he put that murder hornet on his arm. I saw that. Did you see that? I saw the video on Facebook. And, and they, it stung him, and he started screaming. Now, this is a guy who studies this stuff, and they asked him later, because he survived it. They, he just wanted to see what would happen. That's kind of dumb. But anyway, he did it. And he said the pain lasted seven to eight hours. It was horrible. The pain was awful. He, he said he got very, very dizzy. The pain was so bad he got dizzy. He couldn't even stand up. And he said his arms swole up 
to a great proportion. Imagine getting stung by two or three of those, because hornets tend to swarm. Keep that word in mind. To them it was given that they should not kill them, but just torment them five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when he strikes a man. It would burn. And that's what this murder hornet does. And in those days shall men seek death. Now, verse 7, the shapes of the locust were likened to horses prepared into battle on their heads as it were crowns of gold. That's not a real locust or a grasshopper. And their faces were like the faces of men. So these were spirits. These were evil spirits. And they had hair as the hair of women and teeth were like the teeth of lions. They had the face of men, but they had hair like women. They had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron. <coughs> now, we know this is talking about demons because they come out of this pit, otherwise called Tartarus. And yet people have actually wondered, could this also have a dual application referring to robotic things that look like insects? Not men. You know, in the old days when you talked about a robot or an android, you thought it looked like a man. They can make them now very small. They look like insects. They had breastplates as the breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings were as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like scorpions. And there were stings in their tails, and they had the power to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them who was the angel of the bottomless pit. The demons were very much involved in World War II, you can bet on it. The demons were very much involved in it. Uh, theologians have, have had the opinion for many, many years that Adolf Hitler was probably possessed by the devil himself. Now, if you get out, now that was the fifth trumpet. In the sixth trumpet, verse 17, he talks about the breastplates of fire and Japheth and brimstone and the heads of the, his, of the horses whereas the heads of lions and now their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Those are not real horses. These are some kind of, some kind of weaponry, not actual horses. And a third part of the men was killed by the fire, the smoke, and the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. And people have wondered, could this be some form of robotic weapon that we've never seen before? It could be. This might be some type of weapon that no one has ever seen. These robotics that the Russians have, I've never seen one. I don't know what it looks like. They used to have to, in the old days, they'd wiretap you or they could get a little tiny uh, a bug. They called it a bug. And they put these little bugs inside of a lamp. You've seen that in the spy shows. We're putting somebody's lamp. There's a little thing about that big. They called them bugs. And if you'd see one on the wall, you'd think it was just a bug. Well, now they can make them as large as this murder hornet here. They can make them that big and be a little computer, as it were, and they could actually put wings on it like a drone and fly it right in your house and sit there on the wall and listen to everything you're saying. Could they also turn into weapons? Oh, yeah, they can do almost anything they want to do. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at the possibility of these things coming in our lifetime, in our generation, not two or three generations from now, but right now in our lifetime, these things could happen. They talked about swarms of ground robots and swarms, um, thank you, swarms of these robots, swarms. That's The Bible talks about these insects. They were like horses prepared to battle. You've seen pictures of them on television, swarms of locusts, and it makes the sky dark because of all the swarms. Well, here's one more statement. I'll just read this to you. This is from, from a, a German newspaper. The conviction that the war was part of the European past, but not Europe's future, is fading. Europe's, uh, Europeans aged 18 to 24 are, are mo most likely to believe that a war between the European nations is possible in the next 10 to 20 years because they didn't learn from history. They didn't learn how bad war is. So this new generation now is thinking that war might, eh, they might be involved in it. Perhaps the reason we never learn from history, wrote the American poet Charles Simic, is that we are incapable of picturing the reality of war and its aftermath. It is well known, he said, that truth is the first casualty of war. So we've got robotic problems, we've got plagues and pestilences. There's one more thing, though, that I want to talk to you about. And I'll spend the rest of this message on this. Jesus tells us that we are to beware of false prophets. One of the biggest signs that we're in the last days is that there will be false prophets. Now, when I was a little boy, I never heard of anybody being a prophet. Nobody. Oh, there probably were a few, but we didn't hear about them. You didn't hear about them either way back then. Today, on television, there are more prophets than ever before. One guy, I'm not mentioning their names, but I was listening to him about a week ago. God called me to be a prophet, he said. And it seems like 
I mean, I can think of, let's see, one, two, three, right off the top of my head, three that I know to be prophets, maybe four. I mean, right off the top of my head, these people who claim to be prophets. Are they real prophets? Well, maybe. I greatly doubt it, but because uh, I'm just naturally skeptical. By the way, this is a Bible study if you want to ask some questions. Do we have a question now? Well, there are a couple of comments that we can't are very telling. All right, let's hear the comments then. Um, Carolyn has said that lots of people have bought Bibles in the last six weeks, and then Brandy um, said, and they say the name Jesus has been Googled more than ever, along with all the Bibles that have been bought. Oh, that's interesting. So Carolyn said a lot of people are buying up Bibles, and Brandy said there's a lot. Well, of, a lot of people, are, more people are being Googling the name Jesus Googling, than ever before. Googling, Googling the name Jesus. So people are beginning to say, hey, maybe we are in the last days. There, one good thing that could come out of this is that it might wake some people up. It may be a revelation. I mean, not revel, a revival. A revival, yeah. We, let's hope so. Now, <clears throat> let me quote something from Revelation 3 and verse 3. Jesus says this, this is in red letters. He said, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, listen, and hold fast and repent. They're slipping away from the truth. You may let the truth slip. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Be careful lest we let these things slip away. Hold fast. That means hold tight. You know, if my dog tries to run away from me and I don't want him to chase a squirrel, but I grab his collar and I hold fast. Otherwise, he may run out in the street and get killed. So I hold his collar. I hold it fast. That means you hold it tight. Hold fast to the truth what you've received and heard and repent. Repent of what? He was talking to the Sardis church. Spiritual deadness. Let me read to you what Jesus said. <clears throat> and if you want to turn to some of these scriptures, I'll be reading from a whole passage in Acts chapter 20 if you want to turn to that. While you're turning to that, though, let me read to you Matthew 24. This is what Jesus said. Take heed that no man deceive you. Because they said, give us a sign of the last days. He said, take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, claiming the name Christian, saying I am Christ, and will deceive many. He is the Christ. At that time, the only people who believed he was the Christ were Christians. He said, but there will be false prophets that will say I'm the Christ, which he is, not saying they are Christ. Many will come in my name saying I'm Christ. And yet they'll still deceive people. I mean, think about it. The Catholics say that Jesus is Christ, but so do the Jehovah's Witnesses. Big difference between those two groups. So do the Mormons. Uh, so do the Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, most of the cults, the so-called Christian cults, they say Jesus is the Christ. But that doesn't mean they're not deceiving people. Now, also in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 3, Paul said, I beseech you, I'm not turning there, I beseech you by the coming of the Lord and the day when we're gathered up to meet him, don't let any man deceive you, for that day won't come until the come, the comes the falling away first. That day will not come, the day when we're called up to meet Christ until the falling away comes first. Now, look in the margin of your King James and it says apostasy. If you read it in Greek, that's exactly what it says. It uses the Greek word apostasy. In the last days, there will be a major apostasy. Now, we know about churches ordaining homosexuals. Good grief. Uh, we know about churches that are pro-abortion, too. It's, it's astonishing to me. Now, have you found Acts 20? I want to show you something that you have to be aware of. This is the third thing. I've talked about the insect problem here. That Oh, there was something I did not read out of Revelation 6. Let me go back to that. I meant to read that to you. I just realized. One of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Now, this, this is something that has always puzzled me. It's verse 8. Now, listen to this very carefully. This is Revelation 6, verse 8, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse. I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell. The word hell there is the grave. Death and the grave, that's not Gehenna, that's not hellfire now. This is simply the grave. Death and the grave followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, over one-fourth of mankind, apparently, to kill with the sword, with hunger, with the death in general, and with the beasts of the earth. I had never... I've always had a problem with that because we think of a beast as being a big old gorilla, an ape, a, a great big grizzly bear. Now, that's a beast. But in the Bible, a beast was any kind of animal, anything in the animal kingdom. Remember in chapter 28 of Acts, 
Paul is gathering some wood and he picks up a snake by accident. The snake uh, fastens onto his hand and he throws it off into the fire and it says he threw off the beast. A snake is a beast. So in Bible uh, terminology, any kind of an animal, anything in the animal kingdom is considered a beast. And I had never thought about this until I started reading about these killer hornets, these murder hornets. It talks about that one-fourth of mankind will be killed through all these various means, and one of them will be the beast of the earth. That could be insects like the murder hornets. It could be, it, and it may be a combination of all of that. So, yes, it's possible that in the last days dogs and cats will run raving and be mad and kill people. That's a possibility. But it's also possible that, and I never really thought about that, it could also be possible that we could have an insect infestation that could come in here and swarm, swarms of these things that could kill people. So think about that. Now, like I said, I'm giving you this message to encourage you that you can escape all of this if you're doing the right thing. Now, in Acts 20, have you found Acts 20 yet? You probably have. Let me find it real quickly. The Apostle Paul had come to that area of the world where he wanted to call all the ministers, not the laity, but the ministers together, and we'll start in uh, verse 15. We sailed thence from there and came the next day to Chios, and the next day we arrived at Samos, and we tarried, tarried at Trogilium, and the next day we came to Miletus. Now, verse 17, from Miletus he sent to Ephesus, meaning he sent a messenger and a letter, and called the elders of the church, not the laity, but the elders, which I won't take time to prove now, but elders are the ordained clergy, just... Right now, they'll have to suffice because I'd have to, I could give a whole Bible study proving that easily. It's very easily proved. The elders are the clergy of the church. So he called just the ordained ministers. And when they were come to him, he said, now listen to this. You know from the first day that I came into Asia, after what manner I've been with you at all seasons, serving the Lord with all humility of mine. This is Acts 20, verse 19, with many tears and temptations, which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable to you. He's talking to the ministers now. Not the, not the laity, not the church members, but the, the leaders of the church. But have shown you and taught you publicly in that from house to house. So he was having luncheons and dinners in their homes, talking to them. Testifying both to Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That was what Paul testified. And now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, except that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me, abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dearer to myself, that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel. What is the gospel? The gospel of the coming world ruling government? No, no, the testify the gospel of the grace of God the mercy and the grace of God that, that allows us to be saved through Christ. And now, behold, I know that you, that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, how do we get into the kingdom? The grace of God, through the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God. Forgiveness is indeed the first element of the gospel. You have to be forgiven or you will never see the kingdom of God. <clears throat> You'll never be born again without it. And now I, I know that uh, uh, you, among all whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I'm pure from the blood of all men. Now, he didn't refer to his past before he got saved. He means, look, guys, I am pure from your blood. If you go astray, if you do wrong, God won't hold me accountable. I'm warning you. And I'm warning you today. For I have not shunned to declare to you all the counsel of God. Now, I want you to pay close attention to the next few verses. Take Heed, therefore, to yourselves, talking to the leaders of the church of God, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Spirit has made you guys the overseers, you guys are the elders, the overseers of the church, to feed the church of God, which he's purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, the true church, not sparing the flock. Jesus likens his church to, to sheep. He says in John 10, I am a shepherd. I'm the shepherd, you're the sheep. Now, he also says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. He uses these analogies to help us to understand how he looks on us. The branch has to stay into the vine to be fed, but the, but the flock has to be together so they can be fed by the chief, chef, chief shepherd 
First Peter chapter 5 calls Jesus the chief shepherd. So he says, now here's the flock of God's sheep, and you guys are the overseers. You're the shepherds. You're the pastors. The word pastor is the Greek word translated shepherd, by the way. He said, I know that after my departing, and he was getting ready to leave them for good, that grievous wolves will enter in, not sparing the flock. Now listen to verse 30. Also of your own selves shall men arise. He's looking them right in the face, eyeball to eyeball, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. How do you know that a pastor or a teacher is truly a minister of God? Well, I'm going to assume that every one of you watching, that your pastor is a minister of God. But a ministry can make a mistake for several reasons. One, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding the Bible. Good heart, 100% sincere, just make an honest mistake. And if you don't question your pastor by going to the Bible to see if it's really true, you can make a mistake. If you follow somebody who's going the wrong way and you're following him, where are you going? Wrong way. So the first thing is, could your pastor be making a mistake? Always prove all things. You ever heard that before? 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Prove all things. Hold fast. Hold it tight so it doesn't get away. Hold fast that which is good. If it agrees with the scripture, it's good. But so many people say, well, no, I'm just going to follow what my pastor says. After all, he's a man of God. And he may be. But he can make a mistake. Number two, you don't really no 100% sure. You wouldn't bet your salvation on it, would you, that he's a man of God? Oh, you like him. He's good. He's a wonderful guy. He's a great husband. He's a good pastor. Visits the sick. Oh, man, pray for you. Wonderful guy. But you still don't really know, do you? Here's another thing, too. These men were men of God, for sure. Paul said to these elders that the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. And yet he said, oh, even of you, some of you will, will fall away. I had a pastor some years ago, and we were a Sabbath-keeping, Holy Day-keeping church. I mean, we were a commandment-keeping church, and he fell away. My pastor did. Today, mm -hmm. right before you this morning, I had a news alert thing on my phone. There was this pastor. He was a, an associate pastor at some mega church in that place in South Carolina that he lived in St. Louis, and he used to pastor his own mega church, and he got caught doing some things with some church ladies that he shouldn't have been doing, and got, you know, left the church, left his church, mm -hmm. and I don't know if he left willingly or, you know, he might have got thrown out, yeah. But the news alert today was that this guy committed suicide Oof. in the last day or two. This pastor. He, yeah, he had mm -hmm. gone into counseling, and got counseling and had been working with another pastor and he is and it wasn't as was yeah. like as of yesterday or wow. whatever day this happened was an associate pastor yeah. at a big old church in yeah. South Carolina. Yeah. And he committed suicide just in the last couple of days. That's a shame. I know. It's but the wages of sin is death. Yeah. Well the pastor that I'm talking about was our pastor down here in Charlotte and he went astray. And he walked away from the truth of God. He had been to the college out in Pasadena, California. He had been ordained in the ministry. And he left the church and gave up God's truth. And even his wife left him after that. I don't what I know he eventually got remarried, and I don't know where he is today. I don't know if he's even alive today. But but what I'm saying is even true ministers can go astray. Now part of one thing yeah, part you know. of the article also mentioned that a lot of pastors are good at helping their congregation and their flock, but you don't really know what's going on with them personally yeah. inside themselves. Yeah. Like this guy, what kind of demons were driving him that he felt like he needed to commit suicide? Yeah. And he might have been a good pastor, but something was going on in his personal life. That's what caused his suicide. I know, yeah. and, and these pastors that fall away, and like your pastor or whatever, you never know what's going on with them at yeah. home. Or even, yeah. you know, sometimes their wives don't know. What's going on? You know, it, all, all ministers claim to be ministers of God, even the ones that know they're charlatans. Uh, I claim to be a minister of God, but I could make a mistake. I want you to 
go behind me and say, let me look that up in the Bible. Let's say I tell you the world is flat. I'm a minister of God, and I tell you the world is flat. Well, don't get mad at me. I could be making a mistake, but here's what you do. You go to Isaiah, what is it, 41, I think it is. I didn't look it up. And it says, God sits upon the circle of the earth. The word circle in Hebrew means a sphere. In fact, the Moffat version translates it, God sits upon the round earth. So I'm making a mistake, and here's what you should do. Don't just call me a false prophet. Come up to me and say, look at what the, the book says. Give me a chance to repent. I may have made a mistake, and I'll change it, and I'll correct it. Now, if you do that to me or to your pastor, and we don't correct it, then okay, fine. Then don't, don't follow any ministry who won't correct it. But always go behind what you're taught and make sure that's in the Bible. And if you do that, you're not likely to be deceived. One lady one time, this true story, this minister was in the grocery store line. I think it was a grocery store, and he was in this long line, and you know how lines can be so slow. And so this minister did what a lot of ministers do. He struck up a conversation with the lady in front of him. He said, uh, uh, you know, what, what do you do for a living? You've got a conversation going. What do you do, she said. He said, I'm a minister, I'm a pastor. And uh, he, he, so you go to church? Yeah, I go to church. And uh, He said to the lady, do you ever, uh, do, you, do you read the Bible? She said, yeah. Do you study it? Oh, no. She said, I don't study the Bible. He, sw he says, why don't you study it? Now, remember, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show yourself approved. She said, I don't study the Bible. That's what we pay our pastor to do. We pay him to study for us, and then on Sunday mornings, he tells us what the Bible says, and we just take his word for it. We don't need to study. We pay him to do that. Listen, you don't ever pay somebody to study for you. You have a responsibility for your own soul. What did Paul say in Philippians? Work out your own salvation. Your pastor can't do it for you. Your pastor is there to help her, to be a helper. Paul said, a helper of your joy. Ministers are to help you, but they're not to do your studying for you. Anyway, that's my sermon for today. Let me get on with this. That's my introduction. Now let's get into the sermon here. Uh, don't worry, I won't hold you in just a few more minutes. So Paul said even true ministers of God could fall away. Now I want to read to you Second Peter, and I'm going to do this pretty quickly here because I don't want to hold you over, over time. But Second Peter chapter 2 is a, that whole chapter you should read. He said in verse 1, But there were false prophets also among the people, as there will be false teachers among you, who privily will bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them. I know a church in Tennessee. A man came in there and he started sharing with people that the name of Jesus is wrong. It should be Yeshua. And he got about half of them believing it. Then he, after he got them believing that, then he said, well, you know, he's really not the Messiah. And half of that congregation left the church of God and went with this man to some kind of synagogue and denied Jesus. That happened just a few years ago. And I know the pastor down there. And he, he was powerless to stop it. Even denying the Lord. And they did that. That bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth will be evil spoken of. It's people that have the truth, but they're not living it. Now, verse 4, Peter said, For if God didn't spare the angels that sin, he cast them down to hell. Now, this word here means Tartarus. And deliver them the chains of darkness. Now, there's no predicate. The predicate is implied. If God didn't spare the angels, what's he going to do to you? And spared not the old world. He brought in a flood upon the world of the ungodly, only spared Noah. And he turned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. The implication is, what's he going to do for you? And he set an example for those of us who should afterward live ungodly. How about that? And then he delivered just Lot out of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 9, the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. Sometimes punishment is the only way to wake up a child, or anybody for that matter. Punishment is the way you get people to wake up. It's, it's behavior modification, as psychologists call it. And in the great white throne judgment, they will be punished to wake them up. The Bible nowhere says that God's mercy stops the day you die. It says His mercy endures forever. So if even one person in the great white throne judgment were to repent and say, Father, forgive me, I'm sorry, what would God do? Why, well, He'd forgive them. If they repented, and there will be punishment, behavior modification. <clears throat> but chiefly them who walk after the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise government, God governs through his laws, and they despise his laws and his commandments. They're presumptuous. They're not afraid to speak evil of dignities. 
Now, verse 13, they're going to receive the reward of unrighteousness, these people. As they that count it pleasure to riot in the daytime, their spots, their blemishes, they're, now listen to this, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. People in the church who are not truly in the body of Christ, not truly converted. Verse 14, they're immoral. They're beguiling, unstable souls. Verse 15, they've forsaken the right way and they've gone astray. Now listen, you can't forsake your home if you're sitting there on your home watching this. You can't forsake it unless you've been in it. You can't forsake a church unless you've been in it. You can't forsake the truth unless you've been in it, right? Forsake something means you had it at one time. These are people who have forsaken the right way, which means at one time they knew the right way and gone astray. Remember in Luke 15, verse 4, it talks about how that, that if a man has 100 sheep and one goes astray, that means now he's only got 99 left. The other one was at one time a part of the flock, but he went off. So a lot of these people were have been in the church, but they're leaving the church, or they've known the truth and they've walked away from it. Verse 18, when they speak great swelling words, eloquent words, flamboyant, bombastic words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those who were clean escaped from them who live in error. Wantonness in the Greek means, is the word is aselgia, and it means unbridled lust. That's what wantonness means in Greek. But they, they allure these people who were at one time clean escaped. While they promise them liberty. Oh, you don't have to keep the Ten Commandments anymore. You don't have to put leavening out of your house, even though the Bible tells you to. You don't have to fast on the Day of Atonement, although the Bible tells you to. Why, you don't have to rest every seventh day, though the Bible tells you to. Why, I'm giving you liberty. You don't have to do that anymore. They'll even call God's law a yoke of bondage. When Paul said it was holy, just, and good. They promise them liberty, yet they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same, of that same person or thing is he brought in bondage now listen to this carefully for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world how do you do that through the knowledge of the lord and savior jesus christ people say do you know the lord no i don't know him well let me lead you to christ do you know the lord are you saved so after they've known the lord after they have gotten saved if they get back into the pollutions of the world and overcome if they're again entangled therein the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now, that just totally destroys the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Now, let me say very quickly to those of you who believe in that, as long as you hang on to Jesus, you can make all kinds of mistakes. David made some mistakes, didn't he? But Psalm 51 says he still had the Holy Spirit. As long as you hang fast, hold fast to Jesus, you hang on to him, you can make all kinds of mistakes, but you don't lose your salvation. That part is true. But what I'm saying is if you do this, and you get so far away from Christ that you get beyond the point of no return, no, you could lose your salvation. It's a dangerous doctrine to say, Charles Stanley, one of the greatest Baptist teachers there's ever been, he wrote a book called Eternal Security. He said, even if you reject Jesus as your Lord, you're still saved. You think I'm making it up? Go order his book online called Eternal Security. Charles Stanley, he said that in his book. Now, I'm not making that up. I got the book at home. I could bring it here and read it to you. But you get it and read it yourself. Prove all things. He said, even if you reject Jesus, you don't lose your salvation. Folks, that is a dangerous doctrine. That means I can go out here and live like the devil. And because I got saved 30 some years ago or whatever it was, I'm, I got it made. That's not true. What did Peter say? If you have known Jesus and then you go away from him and you're entangled in the things of the world, your, your latter end is worse than before you got saved. Listen, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, which is what this book is all about, than after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. It's better not to have known Jesus at all than to have known him and walk away. What does that say? Where were you before you got saved? You were lost. It would be better to still be in that lost condition today than to have gotten saved and then go right back into it because now you're in trouble. Now you're accountable. People in India who've never heard of Jesus or they heard the name, didn't know who he was. People in Mongolia and China and Japan who have heard the word Christianity but doesn't know what it is, they're not as accountable as you and I are. Do we have a question? Charles, the book that Charles Stanley titled again, 
The name of it is, I think, just simply Eternal Security, I believe. It's a white book. My copy is a white. Of course, it can be anything, but it's, mine's a white. It's only about that thick, but it's a bunch of chapters in there. But he does make that statement. I do want every one of you to get that book and prove it for yourselves. He said even if you walk away from Christ, you don't lose your salvation. That's a dangerous, dangerous teaching. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again. Yuck! And the sow that was washed, she goes back to her wallowing in the mire. Now, I've been around pig pens. I've been around pig farms. and Boy, they stink. Well, I'm about out of time. Let me uh, read you just one more section here. If you turn over a couple of pages to 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18, how do you know you're living the last time? Now, John actually thought he was living in the time when Christ might return, and it was bad then. Just think how it's going to be bad in the literal last days. He said... You have heard, verse 18, that Antichrist shall come. Revelation 13 calls him the beast. Even now there are many Antichrists. That's how you know it's the last time. They, these Antichrists, verse 19, went out from us. Hey, they were in the church at one time. But now they're Antichrist. They were with us, but they left the church. Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us, because if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were really not of us. Then verses 20 through 27 says you have an unction, and that Greek word means anointing. And he says you don't need anybody to teach you this. The Holy Spirit will tell you that much. That if you deny Jesus, you're a liar. Now verse 22 the only way you can be a liar, a lie is an intentional deceit. The only way you could intentionally lie is if you knew better. These people who were in the church know that Jesus is the Christ. He says, now who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He's an antichrist. But that's not saying that the Hindus and the Buddhists are because they don't know he's the Christ. The Jews in Israel do not know Jesus is the Christ. But these people who were in the church and then left, they know better. Verse 28, and now little children, abide in him. Stay in Jesus. Don't walk away from him. That when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Why would we be ashamed? Because we had the truth and we forsook it and we apostatized. One final scripture I want to go back to what I started with in Revelation 3. There's a church here that is spiritually dead in the last days. And verse 1 to the angel in, the, in Sardis, he, he, he says, These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen what remains, because a lot of these people have walked away from the truth. I have not found your works perfect before God. Even though we're saved by grace, God wants us to have perfect works. Perfect works. Now, verse 3, remember, therefore, how you have received. Think about the truth you've received. How you've received and heard. you got no excuse. And every year in August, during orientation, I tell our associate students, our first-year students, by next May this time, you are going to be a lot more accountable than you are now. So if you're not willing to pay the price, you may want to drop out. I, tell, I told them that this, this year, in fact, this past this school year. I said, you're going to be more accountable. God's going to hold you accountable for what you know. So you didn't, don't just come here for a degree. Because if you come here just for a degree and you don't learn all these Bible truths, it's dangerous to learn all these truths and then do nothing about them. Remember how you've heard and received and hold fast and repent. If therefore you shall not watch, and that word in Greek means be alert, stay awake. Doesn't mean watch television. It means stay alert to your own spiritual condition. If you don't watch, I will come on you as a thief and you won't know what hour I'll come upon you. Which contradicts 1 Thessalonians 5 where Paul said to the Christians, that day will not come upon you as a thief in the night. To the world, yes, but not to true Christians who are following Jesus. Well, all seven of these churches, Christ is standing in their midst. Remember, they're like candles, and he's standing right in the middle. He's standing right in the smack dab middle of that circle of candles, and he's just as close to one as he is the other. He loves one just as much as he does the other. And these people have their names in the book of life, which means they are genuine Christians. But he tells them, if you don't straighten up when I come back, it's going to be just like you're going to be just like the world. I will come on you just like I will the world as a thief, and you won't know. Now, verse 5 says, He that overcomes, 
You'll be clothed in white raiment if you overcome. And if you overcome, I will not blot out his name out of the book of life to that man who overcomes. But I'll confess his name before the Father and before the angels. If you overcome, then I won't blot your name out. That's like a thief coming up to you with a gun saying, if you give me your money, I won't pull the trigger. What does that mean? That means he's going to pull the trigger. You better grab your wallet and give him the money and then hope he, he, he keeps his word. But I won't shoot you if you give me your money. We know what that means. Jesus said, if you overcome, then I won't blot your name out. What's he doing? He's staying there with a blotter and he's getting ready to blot your name out of the book of life unless you overcome. Yeah, that means the names have to be in the book of life to start with. So God has, when you got saved, God put your name in the book of life. But he says, but your works, you need to work on them. You need to perfect them. He tells these Christians, your works aren't perfect before God. I'm getting ready to blot your name out. Now that totally contradicts what people believe when they say, once saved, always saved. Live like the devil. I've actually had, i got to go off of you. i got to quit. But let me tell you one thing. For any number of years, I've had people come up to me and say, if what you're teaching about the great white throne judgment is true, that people actually have a chance, still have a chance to be saved during that time, then what's the point of me living a Christian life? Well, I can go out here and rob banks. I can commit adultery. I can do anything I want to. And I'll look at them and i say, you sure can. If that's what you want to do, go for it. We shouldn't love, we shouldn't get saved as a fire escape insurance policy. It's not a fire escape policy. We should get saved because we love Jesus and what he did for us. If you don't want to serve him, then go serve the devil if that's what you want to do. But you will regret it. Amen. His mercy endures forever, but you will regret it. Because what did I just read in 2 Peter 2? He knows how to reserve the unjust to the day of judgment to be punished. And I'll tell you what, with all that you know, with all the things that you and I know, if we go out here and live like the devil, whew, I don't even want to think about it. But if you love Jesus with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, if you love him with all your heart, you're going to want to serve him, not out of fear of hell, but because you love him. And if you love him, you're going to want to keep his law. In fact, he said this, and I'll, I'll, quote, I'll quote one more scripture, and I'll shut up. John 14, 15, if you love me, oh, yes, I love the Lord, how I love Jesus. We sing that song. If you love me, keep my commandments. Do you love him? Do we have a final question? Okay. But here's a question. It says, define works. It could also mean our heart and our time, and not just our time, and our mm -hmm. time not spent with God, not just physical works. Yeah, uh, it can mean our time spent with God, all of that. But mostly when the Bible talks about works, if you check Galatians, it talks about the works of the law. Over and over it talks about the works of the law, the works of the law. So the works of the law would be our obedience to God. And that would also include prayer and Bible study and all that. Uh, but it's primarily obeying God's commandments. Now, you said you had some commandments, I mean, some comments? Here's some comments that go back to the okay. first couple of news items. Okay. Somebody said, oh, here's another comment that says, love Jesus and keep his law in your heart. You keep you keep his law in your heart. If you keep it in your heart, you want to do it in the body, too. Yep, they, if, they, if there's a famine, the animals could travel, like wolves especially, travel in packs, yeah. Well, she also made a comment, which I think I saw this too, that an alligator had attacked and ate a woman in South Carolina, I believe. It's like I remember seeing that. Yeah. You heard about that? Alligators uh, attacking people. Yeah, when, when these animals get very, very hungry, they're going to eat whatever they can eat. Over the beast? Yeah, the beast referred to the animal kingdom. Yeah, there were. That's true. Uh, he's right about that. The Bible speaks about the hornets driving the, the the Canaanites out, where the Israelites didn't even have to fire a shot. The hornets drove them out, and God said, "Now the same thing is going to happen to you if you go in there and you live like them." And eventually, they were all they all had to leave. Every one of them. Any other comments or questions? Um, let me go I've, out of the video so I can see everything because only okay. I appreciate all of your questions and comments. I'm glad you're with us today. Tell others to, to be watching. If you know anybody, if you're going to one of these, uh, uh, what I call splinter churches, share with them these videos. And if you know how they to, might be blessed by it. And if you know how to share it, on, share it.
share the video down at the bottom if you're watching live, especially if you're watching on the smartphone, the iPhone, I don't know how it works on other phones, mm -hmm. but if you slide over where the comment bar is, like mm -hmm. where you see the like and the love and all that, if you slide yeah. it, there's mm -hmm. a share thing too. Share it on your personal page so that other people can yeah. see. Share, learn how to share this on your personal page so others can watch it because you may... If only one person gets blessed from it or, or is protected from the tribulation, then you'll be uh, it'll be well worth it. It might be one of your closest friends or family. So go to where it says like, and then go to where it says share, and share that on your personal. Somebody posted page. that they think that the Book of Hosea is speaking to America. Yeah, the Book of Hosea could very likely be speaking to America. It's speaking to Israel, but yet it really is applicable to America and Britain today. Mm -hmm. I appreciate the comments. I meant to give y'all. A chance to ask more questions. There hadn't been a family last question. Just most of them, everybody bring that in. Yeah, okay. Well, I won't hold you. I've held you a little bit over time, and I don't like doing that. But the bottom line is this: if if you're not taking God's truth seriously, you're going to pay the penalty. Luke twenty one thirty six says, "Watch and pray always, so that." When the time comes when God decides who he's going to protect, it says so that you, if you're watching and praying always, so that you may be accounted, not that you are worthy because your name's in the book of life, but that, that you may be accounted worthy. If you're not watching and praying always, you probably won't be accounted worthy. So watch and pray and uh, be in a, in a watchful situation. Watch yourself. How are you? How do you stack up to the Ten Commandments, the statutes, judgments? Are you keeping God's commandments? Literally. Is your heart right with God? And then he said, watch and pray always. So be always in prayer with God. Jesus said in Luke 18, one meaning always to pray, not to think, not to give up. He says, so that you can be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass. And you ought to read Revelation 13 about the mark of the beast. Let me say one final thing, but I am going to shut up, sure enough. Uh, I was just listening to a preacher this morning on the radio, and he was talking about the COVID-19 virus, uh, where the government is using this, which is probably appropriate, but it does show the power of the government that tells people that, you know, you can't go to church and you, you have to register for this and register for that. And even going into restaurants now, they want your name, your telephone number, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it does show the power of the government. What if we had some bad government leaders, which we do have some now, uh, uh, but we also hopefully still have some good ones or have some Christians in government. Well, what would happen if they want to enforce a mark or you couldn't buy or sell? Yes. It could happen. One of the theories that I've read is that they're going to require you, if they ever develop a COVID-19 vaccine, mm -hmm. they're going to require everybody to take that vaccine before they can go anywhere. And, um, yeah, what if you, what if they put a vaccine, what if they had a little mark that it proved you've had the vaccine? Yeah. I also read, or you couldn't buy yourself. You know, you know, all these conspiracy theories yeah. and stuff, and I don't know if it's true or not, yeah. but I wouldn't be shocked. Mm -hmm. so, and I'm not saying this is true. Yeah. I'm just saying it could happen. That if you're required to take that vaccine, that they could um, put like a little microchip or something in that. And when mm -hmm. they inject you mm -hmm. with that vaccine, yeah. I mean, that's just a theory that somebody had that well, I read, but it's possible. They've got the technology now. They can they can fulfill Revelation 13 well, for the first time. Dogs and cats all yeah. the time. And the, the royal family that microchip the babies and the children so that if they ever get kidnapped, they can find them, which sounds like a good idea, but we have to be very careful. Well, I won't get into that oh, now. because I want you to recap the three signs of the end days again. Okay, then we'll finish. The recap of the three signs. Uh, first of all, it talks about the beast of the field. In other words, all these insects and everything, they are the beast that would come up against us, and we see that beginning to happen now for the first time in American history. Um, and then, of course, it mentions that the swarms of locusts, which are not real locusts, we know that because they got breastplates of iron, that's in Revelation 9, and so the robotics, in fact, the Russian paper talks about the swarms of ground robots, uh, and they're going to be developing more in the year 2020, so this year. So these swarms of robots may be little insect-like things. We don't know. The third thing is, of course, so the first is the, the actual insects. The second one is these robotics. And then the third uh, is the fact that uh, in the last days, even you are going to be tempted to fall away from the truth you know. Don't let it happen.
All right. Well, thank you all for watching. I'm sorry I held you over time. I'm looking at the clock over here. That's why I keep looking over here. It's 20 minutes till, so i got to let you go. Uh, any final questions on there? Um, there's just a slight delay. So slight delay, but then we gotta we got to quit because I don't like holding people over time. Everybody's still watching. Nobody's complaining. That's good. What I'm sharing with you today is a, could be a matter of life and death. So pay attention to it. All right. Thank you for watching. And be sure to watch us every single week. And also, by the way, uh, listen to our radio program. You can listen to it online uh, tomorrow at uh, www.fordbroadcasting.com at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. It's a 15-minute program. and at you 12 o'clock today, your new program is on... Is it 12 o'clock or 12.30? Is it 12.30? 12.30, but I don't know what the website is. It's called the Truth Network. The Truth Network. You can hear it over your computer. The Truth if Network you, today. And if, and if you have the TuneIn radio app, it's called TuneIn. The TuneIn app. The TuneIn app. You can access it that way. It's a full it's, half hour. You look for the Truth Network on the TuneIn app. Yeah, look for the Truth Network on the TuneIn app. Do you want me to show it on my phone? Yeah, and then... Let me see if I can... Can y'all see that? They might be able to. I don't know. I don't know. Can y'all see that tune in app? That's what it looks like. And then you can listen. That's for the half hour uh, on, on Sabbath uh, at 1230 Eastern Time. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow at 1 Eastern Time. And so today's a 30-minute program. And tomorrow uh, is a 15-minute program. Two different broadcasts that you can hear over the weekend. Be blessed. Be safe. So long. And study to show yourselves approved unto God. Is that it? Any questions? Netanyahu already approved putting censors on children. Mm. All right, we're dismissed. Thank you for watching. <laughs>